This episode is made possible by our generous patrons. To learn more, visit patreon.com forward slash ink to film. Welcome to the ink to film podcast where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm Luke and I'm James. And this week we discuss the last two parts of Ray Bradbury's 1953 sci-fi classic Fahrenheit 451. Now let's put Faber's transmitter in our ear and listen to somebody talk about the classics. We've read parts two and three. We've finished out Fahrenheit 451. Uh, this this novel went some places I wasn't expecting uh, from my memory of it. I even I, I did not remember how this novel ended. So other than a couple little things, but yeah, pretty surprising overall. What did you think? Yeah, I agree. I kind of tried to predict in the last episode mm-hmm. where this story would go, and like in some ways, I ended up being somewhat right, but in such different ways than I was expecting. The story's an older story, so yeah. you kind of know going in that some things may be like derived from that. And I kind of felt like, oh, maybe like some other some other stuff that I've seen before is, is derivative of 451. Yeah. And I didn't really feel that way. Like if it was surprising enough and it was interesting enough to where I didn't feel like I was I'd seen it before or anything. But definitely like a roller coaster of things happen. <laughs> yeah, it's um surprisingly th- like thrilling for for this kind of novel. You know, I don't know. It's like well paced. Cool stuff. I, I think we just jump right into the summary, if, if you're cool with that, and then we'll save our kind of wrap up, you know, final thoughts at the very end. Yeah, sounds good. Let's do it. So last we remember Montag and his wife Mildred had a bunch of books that he had he had saved and they sit down to read them. We're in part two, The Sieve in the Sand. So they're, so they're reading him, and as they're reading him, Montag remembers meeting this literary professor named Faber at a park who ends up becoming a pretty important character. And Faber told him, I don't talk things, sir. I talk the meaning of things. I sit here and know I'm alive. So that's pretty telling for what kind of person Faber is, right? Yeah. The way that we're slowly being doled out instances where Montag is like experienced doubt or like felt like certain people were different than the people who were just the sheep following along with the rest of society. Um, They stick out in his mind. And Faber is a a big deal because he was a literary professor who was outspoken when he was talking to a to a fireman. So he didn't say out and out like I have a bunch of books and I'm saving them or anything like that. But you could tell that he's an educated person who was probably trying to conserve knowledge and and keep that stuff alive. Well, and we also learned that literary professors aren't doing so well nowadays. Right. Like they, they are all former long ago. And now they I don't know, they're like kind of the lowest people in society, it seems like. Yeah. So Mildred is not as into these books as Montag is. She's not really feeling it. She's confused by them. She doesn't like it. She misses her TV. She says she misses all the color. She misses her family, right? Montag decides he's going to call up Faber, who he just remembered. And when he calls him, Faber clearly thinks it's a trap. And Montag asks him how many Bibles are left are left in the world. And he's like, there are no Bibles. He thinks it's like a trick question, right? And it hangs yeah. up on him. Montag ends up leaving, just like he, like he can't convince her. So he leaves and he's like, I'm going to go to Faber's house. So he finds Faber's house, gets there and shows him. He's like, I got this Bible. That's like his proof, right? Like, this isn't a trap. I literally have this book and I just want to talk to you about it. Faber lets him in. They talk about it. And there's mention of the fact that I thought this was interesting. Apparently, religion is now told to you through the family. And like Jesus pops up on one of the screens and he like, is part of the family and he just like talks to you about it and it's it's very light and fluffy and apparently he also advertises he's like jesus literally tells you what products to get and stuff yeah which honestly i mean you you probably see some of that like companies even now just mentioning in their marketing or whatever just that a certain religion is associated with their brand and then the people who also practice that religion might be more likely to go um, and do business there. And it makes me think of like the fish, the fish symbol in Christianity. Mm-hmm. It, like if you see that on a business, I feel like that's their way of being like, if you're, if you practice the same thing that I do, then we might get along and do business well together. Yeah. It also makes me think of just a generalized critique of capitalism, especially like ra- rampant runaway capitalism, right? And we, we are to assume that's kind of what's going on here. There's another moment when he's on the subway where he gets this like crazy jingle just like repeating over and over in his head and he can't think and he it's dra- like, driving him crazy. 
And we that's just a, this is just a normal thing, right? They play these like commercials really loudly. And that's something we definitely do today. Um, but I was just thinking about how brands and companies can be shameless, right? And trying to sell sometimes. And I was thinking about like the Pepsi ad that Pepsi got in so much trouble for with yeah, uh, the the riots and what was it, Caitlyn like, Jenner or somebody? N- one of the gen- are Kylie, Kylie, Jenner? Kylie. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know their names. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, she like came up and was like gave somebody a Pepsi can during a riot, and it was like it was like when there was crazy riots happening in America. So yeah, yeah, not uh, pretty tone deaf. Yeah. So I could totally see companies paying for airtime air for Jesus to be like, you know, if you if you love Jesus, you'll get this kind of toilet paper or whatever, right? Brawny toilet paper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that that rang true to me. Yeah, I mean, I can in a in a society like this, I can totally see companies get more and more powerful. They do less subliminal and more in your face, and definitely a, a, a step that I could see us going in if we're not careful. So Faber remembers how when everything started going bad, and he didn't he he had moments where he could have spoken up and didn't, and he he is like always regretted that. He doesn't know it would have made a difference, but I think for his own pride, he feels like he was a coward when he shouldn't have been. So that's, I think, important for his character going forward because his his interaction with Montag is a lot of him, I think, making up for these kind of perceived moments where he didn't stand up in the past. So Faber tells him that books aren't magic. It's what's inside that are magic. And he lists, he says, three things are, are missing from our society. One is quality and texture of information. He does make kind of a gross comparison to uh, how writers like interact with life. Like it's like this woman and like, you know, like making love to her. And then he's like, bad writers basically rape life and leave her in the wheeler for the flies. Do you remember that part? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was wild. I was like, I was like wow. that was definitely <laughs> of its time. Like that was, that was, you could tell that he thought that was brilliant. And it was just like, yeah. Now it's just like, doesn't, doesn't uh, work at all. And, 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 and if you can, you combined like a couple of things like that and the fact that he, uh, to my knowledge, I don't think he ever lists a woman writer in this book when he's talking about all the different writers and he's talking about all the different greats and and, and preserving. I don't ever remember seeing that there, maybe there was one in there, but I was looking for it and I don't remember seeing one. So, yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't think of one. What does that tell you? I I mean, like, I'm not trying to say something about Ray Bradbury other than he was of a time in which this was kind of more commonplace and it's a shame. Anyway, so that was his number one, right? Quality and texture of information. Basically that good writers, give you texture to life and there's a real quality to the information they convey Two, uh, society needs leisure to digest it. Can't have all these distractions. And so that was interesting kind of talking about the ads that were playing in the subway and like the constant barrage of the family, basically saying you have to have like quiet time to reflect and read and then think about the things you read. Right. And that Mm -hmm. leads right into his third part, third thing. And that's the right to carry out actions based on the interaction of the first two things. So not only do you have to have time to digest this quality of information, you also then have to have the right to act based off of that. And all those things are now not necessarily, maybe, maybe if not illegal, they're definitely just don't have them in society anymore. This section that we're covering in this episode felt less like in the first episode I talked about like repression of knowledge and that mm-hmm. kind of thing. And it felt like more of like a warning that Ray Bradbury was saying right. about what society could become with television becoming so prominent and it felt less of of a government thing and it felt more of just like a society becoming complacent warning yeah it does feel very much like a warning and and i think a warning that is still very applicable today um which we can get into more as we go so they talk about this plan that montag has or they kind of joke about it but then faber's like if you want to do it we can do it and the plan is to plant books in firehouses all over the city and then call them, like, call on each other to the go, and then the theory is they'll burn all the firehouses. Yeah. It seems pretty far-fetched that this would work, but it, that that's, like, their one of their plans they have right now. I thought that this was going to be the rest of the book. I thought it was definitely a, a smart plan to not have that go down like that. I don't know. I was, like, I was glad that they subverted that. Plan. Well, they do also kind of realize that society itself has chosen this. And because of that, they've kind of gone too far. And the just burning down the firehouses probably won't be enough. And Faber doesn't want to help him for a minute here. And, and Montag actually starts ripping pages out of the Bible as like a hostage thing. Like, if you're not going to help me, I'm going to destroy this book. And then Faber goes, OK, OK, I'll help you. And they both realize that there's this war, this looming war. 
And they say it might give us an opportunity to kind of do something dramatic, right? And Faber mentions he knows this printer in another, I guess, in another city. Mm -hmm. And he gives this line, which I really like, too. He says, those who don't build must burn. And that just made me think a lot about our society today and how, you know, if you think about burning in like a, just in the destructive sense, right? Like people tearing things down. And and how a lot of like it's like if people if you if you can't find ways to be constructive, like a lot of people do turn to that negativity and you look at the Internet and like there's a lot of that. Right. Like you want to tear things down because you don't like it. Right. I don't know. I, I think that is kind of just an interesting thing to say about society. And it's kind of depressing, but also kind of true. We're also we you and I are both coming from I mean, we think of ourselves as builders, right? Right. If, whether creative or whatever it is, we think of ourselves as builders. So I'd be interested to hear somebody's viewpoint if they aren't necessarily involved in, in like something that's like outwardly very, very creative. I, I So I took it to be like if you're a part of a fan community or part of a listenership or part of a readership or whatever it might be. And you participate in like a um, positive way and you create a sense of community out of it. Mm -hmm. that you are building, like you're building something, even though you're not maybe building the product, it's more about building relationships and building up a, a kind of a community. And so in that sense, you're not. But if you're not doing that, then you are probably the kind of person who, you know, we see people turn from one to the other too, right? Where all of a sudden people's fandom turns toxic and people start tearing things down. Um, it, it happens all the time. Yeah, I, I took it more literally than that. Yeah. I like I like how you said that though. Yeah, I don't think it's like a... Um, I don't think it's necessarily 100% true for all cases, but it is an interesting thing to think about at least, right? I don't know. I guess I just came uh, came at it from the perspective of like people who are who are actively creating something that's seen as art or important or that what they feel is art or important yeah. versus um, people who, who aren't able to express themselves and, and do those things actively and kind of get stuck in this like the rut of like what he's portraying society to be in, in the situation where people are just like, I'm watching TV all the time and I'm just not really actively getting out and doing the things that, that would kind of leave a mark on society in some way. You could also view it as kind of a sly uh, dig at critics, you know. That's true. People, yeah. <laughs> people who can't write become critics. That that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you can't build, you burn. <laughs> I don't yeah. know if that's what he meant, but I, I, I maybe. <laughs> okay, so let's move on. So uh, Faber gives him this ear radio thing. Uh, they call it a bullet sometimes. Reference it as a sea seashell. Doesn't he call it some sort of bug as well? Because like, I was oh, going to mention yeah. the fact that like no, the, it's, it's all metaphorical, right? Like it seems like right. it doesn't have an official name. And instead, Ray Bradbury is using like different metaphors to describe it, which he right. does a lot in this book for a lot of things. I wanted to ask you, he the, the, a lot of the technology keeps being referred to as something similar to like insect or bug or something like the cars are or talked beetles. about as bugs. Beetles, yeah. Beetles, beetles, that's what it is. Beetles. And then like this is like some I forget what he calls the thing he puts in his ear, but it's something bug related. Like, I don't know. And he keeps using bugs. I just was going to ask you. Buzzing and and like making bug noises. Yeah, and I was just going to ask you if you drew anything from the fact that technology kept being insects or bugs. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, now that you point that out, it could be, yeah, it could be some sort of statement about it being a nuisance or being, yeah, like annoying, I guess, is the thing. Yeah. I could, um, but then, like, the cars being beetles, I don't know, some of it's just like a metaphor for, I think, how it looks. Uh, yeah. If you think about a little, a little earbud and, like, you can hear it making noise, it is kind of like a buzzing like a fly kind of thing. I could see that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think it's, he's trying to just find some app metaphors, but you're right. He might be saying something greater. I, I guess I haven't given it a lot of thought. Do you, did you have a theory about that? I didn't. I just kept, because a lot of the ways that you were saying, like you were talking about, a lot of the ways that he describes things are very metaphorical. Right. And for whatever reason, it kept coming back to insects a lot. Animal Animals play a big part as well, but, but insects specifically for technology. Yeah, in a book like this, there's bound to be tons of metaphors that are loaded with like symbolism and deeper meanings and right. and stuff like that. I, I mean, like I don't doubt it that there's there is some stuff like that. It didn't strike me on my you know on this read through as something that stood mm -hmm. out, but it's definitely possible. So he gives him this this and and the the idea is that he can talk him through his meeting with his fire chief Beatty later. He says, you know, you'll have me in your ear and I can help you talk through it. So then Montag leaves and I just thought it was cool. He, he goes to an ATM. It's, he calls it a robot teller and he gets he gets money out from the bank. And this is something Bradbury is predicting at this point because they were not invented at the, at the time. Yeah. Another prediction, right? Not only do we have the blue mm -hmm. bu Bluetooth earbuds, we get ATMs. So Montag really wants to think for himself. 
and he asks Faber went in through his ear. He's like, when will I get to do that? Because right now I'm just doing the things you're telling me to do. Faber basically says you asking that question shows that you're like on the right path and you just have to trust me that that's true. And he's like, I, I, I was, they told me to trust them too. So he's, he, Montag is very conflicted about whether or not he's thinking for himself yet. And that's, that's kind of his journey, right? Like he really wants a freedom of thought and freedom to do the thing that he wants to do and not feel like he's being led by somebody else. Definitely. Oh, so Faber says, I'm going to read you, I'm going to read you books. And also he reads them to him when he, while he sleeps and then he absorbs them, which that's a really cool idea, but pretty sure that doesn't work because I've fallen asleep listening to many things, podcasts, yeah. books, whatever it is. I never wake up the next day and be like, and feel like I know it. <laughs> like, yeah, I totally read that book in my sleep. If I could talk about a fucking cool technology, like I would sign up for that immediately. Just oh, put yeah. on, put on a book, sleep to it, wake up in the morning. Oh, I just read whatever, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's uh two things. That reminds me of a Dexter's Laboratory episode okay. where he like tries to like learn a bunch of stuff while he's sleeping. And then I think like whatever he's whatever device he's using to listen on to it on. I think he's trying to learn French or something. And mm -hmm. whatever whatever he's listening to it on starts skipping and it's it just keeps repeating the same word, the same phrase over and over and over. And he hears it in his sleep like nonstop all night. <laughs> and when he wakes up, he's like lost all the ability to speak English in any way. And he can only <laughs> speak that one French phrase. Nice. So, that. so you're saying then, that there's going to be unintended consequences? <laughs> yeah, you have to be careful of this technology, of this or of the, this ability. But uh, uh -huh. th this, there's also another thing you kind of called bullshit on the fact that like you learn things while you're sleeping. There's another thing near the end that's kind of similar that we should talk about. Yeah, yeah. Where it's like they just kind of are like, yeah, you can do this now. We figured out a way to do this. And I'm like, yeah. Ah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll get to that, I guess. Uh, but this is also very much. Uh, an audiobook, right? Which is really cool too. Um, I don't know where they were at with audiobook technology at the time, but the idea of someone basically with an earbud in his ear while somebody else reads to him, that's that's audible, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Shout pretty out cool. Audible. <laughs> he shouted him out in the fifties, so Yeah. So when he gets home, uh his wife Mildred is with her three friends, and he we find out that their husbands are all away at war. They're there and they're they're having this like really kind of gross talk about children and and how they don't want them. And then one of them's like, oh, it's fine to have them. You can just pop them in the parlor for 10 hours a day. They talk about the election a little bit. Because um, Montag like tries to get him to talk about it. And we learn um, this guy named Noble defeated another guy named H Hogue. And uh, they all three of them based voted, voted to, for Noble based off the fact that he was better looking. And basically not for anything to do with policy. And oh man, does this stuff hit, hit pretty hard um, and and ring pretty true for people who base now maybe maybe you could say it's not always physical appearance, but there's definitely so many people who will vote based off of personality. How you know like and by that I mean like do they like like they like the person they feel like they want to have a beer with the guy like they feel like that guy's gonna have jokes or whatever it is or somebody yeah. rub them the wrong way or or they don't like their attitude whatever it is. I don't know the actual statistic, but there's like something about how, like even just a name like when you go to see, like people who are elected to like local government and stuff mm -hmm. it's like if you have like an appealing looking name or yeah. something like that they tend to be elected for for you know reasons because yeah. people don't know every policy that every politician has and end up voting for superfluous yeah. things sometimes yeah i think i mean there's been lots of studies about this stuff and i and i can't remember where the quotes from but there's there's another movie maybe you'll know it where he says like a person is smart but people are dumb do you know what that's from? It sounds super familiar, but I couldn't place it. Okay. It's from some movie or something, or maybe even a book. I, but anyway, and, and it makes me think of that too, because like a person is smart enough to see around that. And and when you hear this, you're like, oh, pff, I would never do that, right? I would never vote for someone based off of looks or based off of something as superfluous as how likable they seem, something like that. But the problem mm -hmm. is that when you widen that out to a population and a crowd, these trends do appear and they do affect things. And... It's weird how that happens, right? But it does. You know, it's like the person who, you know, someone yells someone yells fire in a theater, one person can get out safely, but if you get a crowd of people, they trample each other. So there there also can be like this group thing that happens too where like people to gossip with their friends and and the likability of somebody can affect the way they talk about them and the lo the look of the I just find that guy attractive or you know, right. woman, you know whatever it is a person uh, for reasons that we're not electing them for, like they're not being elected for a pageant or whatever. They're being elected to, to run a country. 
um, you know, other shit gets in there. It sucks. Um, I, you know, I'm someone who wants it to be a lot more clinical and more and like, I don't know, strip that stuff away because it doesn't matter. But <laughs> I, you can also argue that I guess some of that stuff can matter for like, you know, well, other people like them, like other countries and stuff. But I don't know. We can talk about the whole episode about that kind of shit. So I think we just yeah. move on. <laughs> you can check us. You can check out all this stuff on our other podcast. Talking <laughs> ink to politics. <laughs> ink to film to politics. <laughs> yeah. So while he's like arguing with with uh, Mildred's friends, he gets out this book of poetry, and he's like shaking it at them, and he's and he decides he's going to read it, and he also they they have this cover saying once a year he gets to bring home a book to like show like his family how stupid it is or something. And that's their cover story. And Faber keeps telling him like, you're going to ruin this whole thing. Don't do this. He reads this poem um, called Dover beach. And when he's done, one of her friends, Mrs. Phelps is sobbing when she's, when he, when he finishes and she doesn't know why. And then he yells at them and they all leave. Did you get a good sense or what, what was your theory for why one of them was, was crying? Like what, what made her, was it, was she affected by the poem or was she crying because the sound of it like uh, insulted her so much. I think it may have been like her inability to understand what was going on. Okay. So her confusion. Like so maybe it was to... the poem. Maybe the poem was affecting enough to where it was like, she was like, I don't know. It might just be something as simple as she, she just like was so offended by the fact that a book was being read around her or something like that. Yeah. I, I like to think that she was affected by the emotion of the poem. Cause it's a pretty mm-hmm. sad poem. Right. And if you don't ever read or hear poetry or anything of substance, the first time you hear something like that, I could see it like really affecting you. Right. And and you thinking, I don't like this. This is this is making me sad. Like, I really don't like it. But it's really that just intense emotion is what actually you're reacting to. Right. Yeah. Montag goes back to the firehouse and he gives Beatty the book. And they throw it away into the fire immediately. And he sits down to play poker and Faber's in his ear. And Beatty starts interrogating him, basically. He starts flinging all these book quotes at him. He, he starts arguing that books are full of lies and that they're, fu- they're full of confusion and insanity. And he just goes on this big, long diatribe, which is really something pretty special. Um, I recommend reading it. Um, and, and it's this really this like diatribe against books. And Faber, at the end of it, says, OK, he's had his say. Let's like sit with it for a little while, you know, and it seems like even Faber is a little bit impressed by this guy's speech. Right. And kind of taken aback. Yeah. He's like the antithesis of our main characters or the characters who are fighting for for good. And it's not due to lack of like education or lack of knowledge or anything like that. It's it's because of his knowledge that he's like the person that he is. He in fact, he's using quotes like he says, I mean, in, in the amount of quotes he's using shows a deeper level like this guy just hasn't read a little bit here and there. It's like he's memorized these books yeah. because he's saying you might quote so and so and say this and then I would use the same quote by that same author who he later wrote a different book where that counteracts the thing you just said like he was on it, you know, like he was ready to debate with right. him and Montauk's just sitting there not saying anything and just getting like berated and it's interesting i I mean i guess i can mention it here but there is like this little afterward section in the book that i read where ray bradbury talks about it's kind of weird it's like he said he had this scene in mind when he revisited the characters and the idea was that Beatty actually had this like library at home but then he claims that he doesn't ever read the books in it but then it's kind of revealed that he must because that's how he knows all this stuff so it's like he has this weird relationship where he's in denial where he does read these books but it was like he was also frustrated with them because they didn't provide the answers he was looking for, I guess, is the other thing, right? Yeah. In the afterward, he, he talks about something about how it's not illegal to own the books. It's illegal to read the books. Right. So so the fact that he has them, he, he basically says, like, you'll never catch me reading it, though, kind of thing. And like, so like, even though he says he doesn't read them, I what I got from it is that like he does read them, but like in such secret and in like with such hatred or something, just so that he knows. I I don't know. It's just something that, and he's not keeping them for any sort of like. I don't think he's keeping them because he sees them as important. I think he's keeping them because he's like these are evil in some way. Yeah. And like it's like his his defense is inside. He's a, twist, he's a twisted character, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it felt a little bit weird to me to have that in the afterward. Like, I don't I know so that I like that. Yeah. 
It's like he, he in the afterward, he says, I don't want to go back and, and, and change the writing of my younger self and all this stuff. Right. But he does basically do that. Right. He says that he was like revisiting it for like a play or something. Yeah, that's true. Because he yeah, he he adapted a play based off of it. And um, there was the movie, the other the older film made off of it. So it had it has continued to have this life of ad- ad- adaptation. And so because mm-hmm. of that, the story has grown over time. And so yeah. why not let him kind of in, include a scene? You know what we should look for? Will there be a scene like this where we go to Beatty's house and we see like a library in his house in this yeah. new HBO adaptation? It'll be interesting to see, right? That will be interesting. Oh, just for context for the listeners, the afterward, I think he wrote the afterward in like the mid 80s or something. So okay. like 30 years after he had written the original. Yeah. All right. So right as they're having this big argument, an alarm goes off. Um, in the firehouse and Beatty drives the truck this time and he, they all kind of pile into the truck and he he's like going crazy like I love the way he's described he's got this like madness in his eyes his his cloak is like billowing behind him like a bat's wing as he's just crazily piloting this thing you know what I thought of honestly and it's kind of silly but do you remember 101 Dalmatians the cartoon yeah oh yeah do you remember when Cruella DeVille is driving her crazy long car and her like coat is just billowing behind her and she looks insane? Her eyes are all massive and like... That's really what I was kind of picturing for him right here. <laughs> That's funny. Um, anyway, so they arrive there and he's like super excited and he's looking at Montag like, ha, look where we are. And they arrive at Montag's house and that's the end of part two, right? Mm-hmm. And it's this big cliffhanger. Oh, shit. Which, I mean, I don't know. It makes sense. Like this feels inevitable, Right. Right. This, I mean, but the third, I will say that what happens next didn't feel like it was, I was like, oh shit, that was <laughs> Some all crazy shit happens, yeah. yeah. So so Mild- so as they arrive, uh, Mildred's coming out of the house and Montag's like, was it you? And she doesn't respond. And she gets in the t- at a taxi and drives off. And that's the last we see of her. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do get the implication that she she called. Um, actually, Beatty later confirms it. So ba- Beatty says, you have to burn this stuff yourself. Like, this is your mess. You have to clean it up kind of thing, right? And so, and, and Mondag does. He's like, he's super stunned. And, and, and Bradbury does a really good job of describing the emotions in these scenes where he's just like, you can feel his uh, day, like this daze and this stun, like the stunned state of mind he's in where he's kind of doing things, but he's, he's still just, he's off kilter, right? Like he's not really in the right frame of mind for any of these moments. Yeah, and there, there's like a, a recurring thing that continues to show up is his hands moving on its own. Like he talks yeah. about like how like he grabbed the book and put it under his armpit in the first part. Yep. That was all his body moving on its own. And then even here, he's talking about how like he's just watching his hands as he's burning all this stuff and like thinking about um, and we, it continues to show up again. Yeah. So uh, Faber is in his ear kind of going like, what's going on? What's going on? And he keeps asking questions, but like Monte can't really tell him because it would give away the fact that he's talking to him. Right. So he's he's at one point uh, Faber says, get out of there. You have to run. Right. Like because it's getting bad. And Mm -hmm. and um, Beatty has really figured him out. And as he says that Montag says, "Okay," like basically he's like, "Okay, I'm going to do that. And he I guess he tries to run and then Beatty hits him. And mm-hmm. when he falls, the uh, the earbud, the the bullet, the green bullet, whatever it is, falls out of his ear. And Beatty's like, aha, I suspected you had one of these things. And he t- he takes it and he like, I think he breaks it, right? Crushes it. Oh, no, he puts it in his pocket and he's going to trace him. It trace it back to, to. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Because yeah. he says, we're going to use this to find your friend. Right. But no, he must turn it off or something, though, because otherwise, you know, Faber would hear all this. There's somewhere he, he somehow disables it, but he does something. Ha- he yeah, something it. happens where like Faber is trying to talk to to Montag still. And he like and then like uh, Beatty like puts it up to his ear and can hear that he's talking. And he's like, yeah. oh, we're going to trace your friend now. Yeah. And here's the moment you were just referring to Montag's hands kind of like of their own volition, turn the flamethrower on Beatty and. Montag says, we never burned right. Emphasis on the right. Mm-hmm. And then he torches Beatty. <laughs> and yeah. it's described pretty brutally. Like it's him crazy. just freaking twisting up and turning into this little crumpled piece of gristle. Yes. And when he talked about like how uh, the way he described it was like it was like he was melting in on himself, like some sort of like clay figurine or something yeah. like that. I was like, that is like a perfect description for <laughs> somebody being burned yeah. like, uh, like Bradbury in such a way. Bradbury is a master at at descriptive language like this. Uh, it's incredible. And when he turns it on, it, it, I mean, it can be really quite affecting. Mm-hmm. And it definitely is here. And I wanted to ask you, when Montag says, we never burned right, what does he mean? Well, what I took from it was that like w- what 
people should have been doing is burning the people that were that were coming up against like they're instead of burning books you're supposed to be saying like we should have been resisting these people right. who were trying to take these things away from us so burn burning down whatever structures were pushing against them i agree I, fire equals destruction and he, i th- i think in this moment he's saying we should have been destroying the oppressor the oppressors right like the people mm-hmm. who told us not to have books like are are who are trying to oppress our society that's who we should have been burning that's who we should have been destroying and fighting and so in that moment which he turns it on Beatty, that's a pretty you know powerful thing to say right so my i have a question for you in the scene where what happened to the other firemen so they're standing there and then he knocks them out do you remember this All so of them? He, he, he there's two other ones i guess i i don't know why there's only two but he only lists two and he turns mm-hmm. the flamethrower on them and they're just stunned. And then I think he like tells them to turn around and then he hits them in the head. It happens okay. very fast. Okay. See, I thought that something like that happened, but I was like, I was like, they would have fought back if their captain got burned alive. No, I think they're just freaking stunned by everything that's happened. Like he says yeah. when they looks at him, they just look dazed. Um, Cause I think they're a little gotcha. bit on the fence is, is the implication. Like they're not as true believers as Beatty is, you know? Yeah, that's true. They're just going along with it. Yeah, so they're kind of like, holy shit, I don't know what's happening. And that's why he doesn't kill them. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, he doesn't just torch the other ones, too. You know? <laughs> right. Um, so the hound arrives, though. And it it comes for him, like, immediately, because he's done this thing, right? And he flames it, but it injects his knee with, like, a needle. And he flames it, and it dies, basically. And then what I could not figure out, and I'd have to parse it, like, word by word, and I probably could if I did it, but... I want to see if you had the same confusion. It sounded to me like he got hit by a car that was speeding by at 90 miles an hour. But then I couldn't tell if he actually got hit by the car or if he was making a comparison to it feeling like how that would feel. I think I think that's what he was. I think it was that's what I got from it was that he was comparing it to feeling like if he got hit by a car because his leg was like completely useless then because yeah. like the thing jumped on his leg and like like got him with a needle. Um, and, and, and it's interesting because I don't know like. I would almost say it's a criticism, but I don't know if it's fair because you could argue it makes for really interesting writing. But Bradbury often his metaphors are so intertwined in his in his language, it can sometimes be difficult to tell if he's talking literally or if he's talking if it's a metaphor, mm-hmm. right? Right. And that this is a moment where that kind of happens. These dogs are terrifying, by the way. Yeah. This is what this is the kind of shit that I'm scared of, man. Like the, the really? when technology when techno not not like this isn't like my fear. Oh, have you seen like the Boston Dynamics? Exactly. Videos That's what I was gonna say, where the dogs are like opening doors and stuff now, and it's like this is like this is <laughs> these are the steps that these these things turn into. We they uh-huh. we weaponize them and then and uh-huh. then like they get they either are being controlled by somebody who doesn't agree with us or they, they have their own like thoughts and ideas and then and then they don't agree with us either so yeah i mean they're basically drones they just don't right, fly yeah These right. are basically you know automated drones um definitely and and it, they're just described in a really uh kind of cool way because they're the 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 needle is like in their mouth and it or right. like it seems like and it's almost like saliva because it's dripping and stuff mm-hmm. so that's pretty affecting uh also in that afterward bradbury mentions that they are a clone of the baskerville hounds from uh from the sherlock stories yeah or sir arthur conan doyles sorry that's what i kept thinking of though like for whatever reason hound is so tied to hound of the baskervilles for me right and like i just kept thinking of that hound the imagery of like the hound standing on the hill in the shadow yeah so i thought that was interesting like he basically saying like so much as he he this is exactly that (laughs) that's crazy i didn't end up finishing the afterward but uh that's like that's completely what i was thinking so his leg turns numb and he's like basically limping around with this numb leg and he's he knows he's got to get out of there right he's on the run and he finds a few books that he had hidden that Beatty didn't find and he kind of gathers those up goes to a gas station watches his face and he can hear through the like you know through the wall like the the pursuit being put on there's police helicopters in the air now and he starts walking down this road afterwards and he hears this beetle coming, which is what he calls the cars. I, you know, I call them cars, whatever they are, um, some sort of traveling <laughs> device, vehicle. <laughs> and mm-hmm. he thinks it's the police and he starts running and then like he falls at the last second and then the thing like swerves around him and like brushes him. And we find out that it's just children. It's like a bunch of young children in there. And he thinks these might have been the same ones that ran down Cl- Clarice. This this part is something I definitely want to talk about. I don't know if they were necessarily chil- children. I I I, did, I thought that he was saying that they were like younger kids, like teenagers or like yeah, kids teenagers, who were just like mischievous yeah. people. 
this is this is a part that I was like drawing so many things from this because at the the way that he describes everything going down, I will finish finish what happens in the scene and then we'll, we'll talk about it. So he gets up and then they turn back around like they're coming back to to, to take another pass at him, and he realizes yeah. that the reason they swerved is only because he thinks that it would have made the car flip to hit him when he was laying down. Mm-hmm. It's pretty. I mean, it's pretty damning. But you could, I mean, part of you could say, oh, this is like someone making a statement about young people. But we have to remember, first off, Bradbury was only in his 30s when he wrote this. So he wasn't like old man Bradbury yet. And then second off, it's children in this society who have been raised without books, right? It's like they have no moral compass because they haven't had knowledge and history and anything to fill them. So I guess he's saying people turn more animalistic and and there's a lot of people just with like casual cruelty in this book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Like people who say like, yeah, kick that dog for me and stuff like that. Mm. Like there's a lot of talk about like running down dogs for sport in their cars and like all this stuff. And yeah, it seems like casual cruelty uh, is kind of a symptom of this. It's like a lack of empathy, I guess. That's what I think. That's what I think he was trying to get at the, and I think that it is, it's this society Kids by nature, like they're what for whatever reason, tend somewhat sometimes to be like mischievous and do do certain things. So like in our society now, like or or just in general, like young boys like will get like a slingshot and be shooting it at targets and stuff, and then they're like, what else can I shoot? And then they just like you know shoot out like somebody's window or something, and and it, you know like things like that happen, and it's just like I, some experience thing. And I feel like th- this is his way of saying like in a society like this where things escalate to this point, a lot of things can escalate. Like you can you can affect how kids like. You you were just saying like how kids they don't have like a moral compass really because they haven't been taught so at this point montag says he realizes that Beatty wanted to die and it's his, at least that's what he's telling himself in his mind right to make himself feel better about burning him because he says why else would Beatty have let me be armed and let me like hold this so that's kind of his like he convinces himself because he's pretty upset by it right that he murdered mm-hmm. somebody well, as um, you should be murdering yeah. someone. Well, but did you did you think anything of that? Like, do you think that he actually did feel that way? Do you think he was like, bur- like Beatty was like burdened by the knowledge and, and like there was some part of him that didn't want to be in this situation anymore? Or? I don't know. It kind of sounds like an excuse to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's more just that Beatty was kind of getting off on his power and didn't think he he would do it. I right. think it's more, you know what I mean? Like, like he just didn't think, I don't think he believed that Montag would do it. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. That's an interesting debate. So he makes he has a pit stop on his way to Faber's house where he goes to another fireman's house and he leaves a book in there and then he calls in an alarm on him, um, which I guess is kind of a distraction. But it's it's like part of their plan, right? From before they had, like talked about like setting people up. So I felt like he was just making good on that. But also I felt like why that specific guy? Did they give details as to why he screwed that guy over? No, I think he was just on the way. Yeah. So he arrives at Faber's house. And they talk about what happened. Uh, Faber t- turns on this tiny television, which is only the size of like a postage card, which I always thought was pretty cool. It's like, it, I mean, like it's not a phone, but it's basically a phone, right? Like How it's people basically use like a smartphone now. screen. Yeah, exactly. Right. To watch um, stuff. This, this is an interesting statement that he had when he brought that phone out or the phone, the screen out was that he didn't want to have like a monstrous TV in his house because it's it's become so encompassing and like you can't you can't get away from it as easily. He said that he wanted something he could he could cover with his hand if he felt like it was there was something that he didn't want to see anymore. And I just thought that like I like the I like I need my big TVs to watch <laughs> my my shows and, uh-huh. and my my movies and everything. And your um, family. But I like the what's that? My family. To, to I need to watch my family. family okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's really important to me. Um <laughs> Genuinely, like, you, all right. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna talk about why big screen TVs are better, but <laughs> I'm just good. saying, like, it's gotcha. a, you get a great experience. I agree <laughs> with a bigger screen, but I like the idea of somebody being, um, like, acknowledging the fact that something like that can become so important, or it, it becomes so imposing when when a big TV like that is playing like Talking Heads news broadcasts and things like that, where it, it, they become physically literally larger than life in your in your house like you're seeing these massive heads on the screen that are i don't know it's just something about the weight of the size (laughs) and thought it was interesting for sure man so they realize that another hound is being brought in on this on this telecast right and they think we have to try and shake this we have to try and shake the the trail here so they come up with this plan to like change up his clothes and and they're gonna he's gonna like scrub a lot of stuff and and try and throw throw off the scent and Montag leaves, and they they set a rendezvous 
where they're going to meet up in, like, I think, a different city if they survive. Mm-hmm. And then Montag leaves, and his plan is to get to the river. So he he's running to the river, and he sees he occasionally like looks at other people's houses and sees the, the the chase going down. He knows that the 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 hound is on the trail, and he does see it come up to Faber's house and then turn away. So whatever mm-hmm. that he does like works, right? Right. Uh, so we yeah. also know that like millions of people are watching this broadcast. Like everybody who has those panels, like, like it turns and on stuff. and it makes you watch it basically, right. right? And then there's an interesting thing where it's like it command they command everybody to come out on the count of ten. And like look for him, yeah. And he just barely <laughs> evades that and gets in the river before they do. I don't know right. how believable it is that people would actually obey, but maybe in this society, maybe they would. Yeah, to be a part of it or something. Yeah, I don't know. So yeah, he he, he plops down in the river and then he starts floating his way out of the city, and it's very like a lazy river to me. <laughs> um, you know, it's very like gentle and warm and just like he, like I would think it would be way more miserable than this, but he's just like floating along without a care in the world, and yeah. he floats his way out of the city. Um, I think this is a good a good place to stop and tell you about Audible. So Audible is a service that you can use to listen to over 80,000 audiobooks. They've been nice enough to give us an affiliate link. It's audibletrial.com forward slash ink to film. Yeah, all you got to do is put that little bullet in your ear, listen to a narrator, uh, teach you teach you books. Maybe you want to listen to it while you're sleeping. Who knows? Maybe it'll work. I don't know. <laughs> I want to recommend Ray Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles. I mentioned in the last episode that I really adore that book. And I just looked it up and it is on Audible. Highly reviewed. A lot of people love the narrator. I haven't listened to the audio version, but I kind of want to now because <laughs> um, it's been a while since I've read it. And it's it's loosely connected stories about humanity going to Mars, and crazy stuff happens in that book. It's like it's it's wild. Like I, I can't even like express to you how fun it is. And in, in in dark and like some of the stories are really dark, and some of them are really uplifting. And it's it's just a really amazing collection of short stories. They're all loosely connected, but they're all about the same thing humanity going to mars really cool not very scientific but but very cool cool can you compare it to anything or is it just like very much like its own thing it's very much its own thing yeah i i struggle to compare it to to another to another book like that i've read um i i don't know that i have i mean i'm sure there are i'm not you know i don't have this like giant collection of fan like sci-fi novels that i've memorized so i'm not the Mm -hmm. best person to do to to make a comparison but yeah i think it's pretty unique you don't have a large collection of sci-fi novels that you've memorized yet. Yet. Because I'm working on eventually it. we're going to figure out how to all have photographic memories. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait till I have that memory and I can just read a book and then become that book. Speaking of that, let's get to the rest of this novel. But if you wanted to check out Audible, sign up using our link. It's audibletrial.com forward slash ink to film. You can get a free credit. You can get the Martian Chronicles for free. Listen to it. Let us know how it goes. Send us an email. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's get into the rest of this book. Let's do it. So he's floating down this river and he has this. And this is another moment where I almost thought this was actually happening. He has this like daydream about going and finding a farm and sleeping under a, a windmill and then waking up in the morning and finding like food and milk has been left to him by this like daughter, like farmer's daughter he saw or something. And it was a little bit like this is a little crazy. This is happening. And then and then he's right back in the river. And we mm-hmm. realize that he's kind of been having this like fantasy about it. Um, did you, did you have that same kind of like, weren't sure if it was actually happening thing or was it just me? (laughs) I find it interesting when, because it, it, you, for a second, you almost feel like it's real. It also makes it like a little more dreamlike. I don't know. I I do agree that like sometimes it's difficult to parse out exactly what's happening. Um, and you kind of get lost in it and you have to maybe reread it real quick to really understand what's going on. But I also think that like it's, it can be because I did feel like it was like a dream because it felt so real. It was like a dream. Well, and they do this sort of thing in movies all the time, right? Right. I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of a like a trick that they do, but they'll do the thing where like something crazy happens, and then and then the person wakes up and it was just a dream or whatever, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, and whatever it was you just saw didn't actually happen, or it was just a fantasy. Like there's a lot of shows like uh, Scrubs all the time. They'd have these mm-hmm. little fantasies, right, where something crazy would happen. It's kind of has right. he kind of has a Scrubs moment here. <laughs> <laughs> I did not think I was going to make a scrub re- Scrubs reference during this book. <laughs> Neither did Ray Bradbury. He was like... <laughs> there it is. Uh, <laughs> so so he does come out of the water, and it's cold and miserable, and he sees this shape moving in the woods, and he thinks it's the hound, but then it ends up just being the deer. Um, and he finds this railroad track, like lucks into it by hitting it with his foot, and he follows the railroad track, and he immediately comes upon a camp. 
and there's a bunch of people huddled around a fire, which is just warming. And this first time he's seen it as like the fire being warming and kind of inviting and not destructive. Yeah. And he joins the people at the fire and a man introduces himself as Granger. And uh, he knows him. He knows he's, he, his name's Montag. And he gives him this drink and he says, drink this and the, and the hound will lose your scent. So he does that, right? Right. Future stuff. And he, fl- yeah, and he flip on this little portable TV that they have, even though they're just like homeless people in, in, in a camp on, on the railroad. They have this little portable TV and he shows it to him. And it's the it's the it's the police chase. And he predicts rightly. And then we watch it happen that the police are just going to pick a random dude that they know about who does like who does like late night walks and say that's Montag and they arrest him and, and execute him. And that's just to like save face. Right. Right. For, for the public. And this is the kind it. of like dystopian shit that you get when you have state run news agencies and propaganda mm-hmm. and shit like that. Right. Like it's it's anything that goes against the narrative has to be destroyed and erased and 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 not talked about. Yeah. I mean, they they've taken full control of of people's like per, like what they're seeing in such an extreme way that they just see this guy go down. They they something said about how. Um, not even your best friend would have known that that wasn't you because of the way that they set everything up and and like they never showed his face enough, but it might as well have been you and all this other stuff. It was, it's just wild to think like this is the kind of stuff that would happen because a government doesn't want people to lose faith in it, right? A government that's that's become this controlling right. doesn't want people to lose faith in it, faith in it. Totalitarian regimes rely on public trust right like they rely on they people have to buy in that if they're going to allow government to have this much control it's because it works and so anything that goes against that narrative is very dangerous to them and so you saw this in nazi germany you see this you see this with dictators all over the world who will very strongly i mean north korea they very strongly control the news that their people are getting right and that's what's so terrifying when you see this kind of stuff happening right in our country and it worries you because it's like this is where that shit can lead if any story that doesn't agree with your narrative is therefore not covered um it can lead to this kind of stuff where it's out and out lies right something i will say just on a positive note is that mm-hmm. in a in a situation like this where where you can look and see that governments that are doing this they they realize that public opinion is so important to what they're doing that just goes to show how much power the people of the the citizens of those governments have ultimately if they band together and do things the right things the moral things and and um because they're acknowledging the fact that public opinion is so important then public opinion we should wield that in a situation that could potentially happen you know well said i I agree with that man so montag finds out that each one of these guys is a book (laughs) and this is the thing you were talking about earlier yeah and Somehow, through some method, they found a way that if you've read a book, you can now m- remember that book and become that book. So Montag has has memorized a book of the Bible, and he's going to... Well, I mean, he hasn't memorized it. He's read it. And they say, well, you have memorized it through this method, right? And this is what you're talking about before, where it's like a little hand wavy. I don't know how it works. They were saying that everyone, every single person has photographic memories and there were methods of pulling things that you've read one time, as long as you've read it one time and seen it with your eyes, that you could pull that out and, yeah. and it could be re- Well, And, then my, and my, my question is, why are you only one book then? Why are you not every book you've ever read? Right. Maybe it's too much knowledge. Something to do with the method? <laughs> yeah. I, I do want to say, like, we'll talk about this in a second, but I do like the idea of the importance of one book, you being one book and this other person being another book yeah. because people in the society have no importance, right? They've become nothing but shells. And, and like, the idea that, that you're so, like, you're... Caretaker of the book. Right. You're, you're, you are, you're the legacy of this book. You're, you are, you've become important just in the fact that you, you are the torch carrier for this. So um, there's another movie that is a direct descendant of this idea. I think I already know where you're going. I don't know. I don't know if I should say it because I guess it's a spoiler. Should I just spoil it? I think I think so, man. Yeah. So there's another there's another movie called The Book of Eli. Yeah. Have you seen that movie? Yeah, I've been thinking about this movie throughout the most of this. Yeah. The I mean, it's a spoiler for that movie, but let's just say this idea is the heart of this movie. That right. there is someone who is a book, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I like he had the the writer of that had to get it from this, right? 
I believe I can't so, imagine. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that, yeah. I think this is the the adventure that happens in the book of Eli is what happens from the end of this book on, right? <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. He's one of the people, like, yeah, uh, he was one of the people at the fire. Denzel Washington was there. He didn't realize it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so Granger also says, you can't make people listen. They will have to come around in their own time, wondering what happened and why the world blew up under them. And I thought that was a really interesting thing to say because you can look at it as very pessimistic, but you can also look at it as pretty damn true. And we've seen that a lot today, right? Like people, you can't change their minds. You can't make them listen to you. And the 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 the, the, fi- the way this book ends is very grim. Yeah. And it's kind of a, the only way this is going to get fixed is it all fucking blows up in their faces. And then the people who are left, you hope that a few of them will remember the lesson of why it blew up to where next time it won't happen. Yeah. And it's kind of like if it gets this if it gets too far down a road, there's no coming back. It's kind of the lesson that I that I got from here. Yeah. There's I mean there's so much to talk about here. They they talk about the phoenix and uh, like the human race being this phoenix that rises and, and well, like, well let, let me let me just go ahead and right. say what happens. So so they also were talking about this war the whole time and all of a sudden the, the bomb goes off, right? Like these jets come flying in and the city that he was just in gets leveled. And I and I interpreted it to be an atomic bomb, but I think so. Yeah, I don't I'm know bomb. if it is or isn't because they also then go back into it. So I don't know. Maybe they didn't know enough about because this is fifty three and like right. literally. I mean, when did we drop the bomb on Hiroshima? Like it had 40s. to have been forty forty five, right? Yeah. Something like that. Right. So this is not long after that. So I could also see that maybe like the public didn't know a ton about atomic bombs and radiation and how you know fallout and how that all works. Right. I felt like that was kind of, uh, that's how what I drew, either that or it was a different type of future bomb that doesn't right. li- leave radiation or something. But um, I just wanted to shout out the sequ- all of the sequence, everything that goes on when the bomb is going off is unbelievably described. Oh, yeah, because he has this like fantasy about his wife, right? Right. Talking about? And, yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Describe that. So Granger kind of, kind of calls the fact that this is going to happen. He's like, the bomb, like, we're about, this is about, we're about to see the end of all this. And, we get all of this description of like exactly how it's happening, and um, he he has Montag has like a vision of his wife because he knows his wife is still in the city. He has a vision of her in her hotel room as the bomb is like inches away from hitting the top of her building and like uh, ha- less than an inch away. And like as it hits, she's watching her shows and and he thinks about like w- the bomb maybe hitting the TV station first, so all the screens turn off, and she sees her own reflection and has all of these thoughts of herself in that moment. And yep. then n- realizing what and, she's become, and right. she's like a, a like a lonely person in an empty room, staring at a blank wall, kind of thing. Yeah, and and I mean, just all of it. It's very. It's. Uh, and then the building comes down on top of her. Yeah, I thought it was just <laughs> going to say like the bombs dropped, and it's all it all was crazy. But the way that he describes everything that goes on in the city, like jumps up, like the city and the bomb switch places at one point, and the city's like really uh, the entire city skyline has basically just been like blown up into the air. Yeah. And it's like he talks about how the buildings are higher than they ever thought they would be and, and it all comes crashing down and I, I thought it was like very affecting and, and like we you talked about before the end of this is, is very sad. And I felt very melancholy as as I finished this book. Like I, I yeah. It's not like uplifting. It's not like it'll you know, no. all be okay. It's like it might be okay, but it's gonna it's like society gets fucking destroyed. Right. And we we real we find out that this is happening in like multiple cities, right? I yeah. Don't think well, it's just yeah. This he, th- one. he theorizes all over the world. Like yeah. this is another world war or something. And they're left to the way and like the bomb, like the shock waves are hitting them. They all fall over. They're far enough mm-hmm. away to where they can see it, and and it's it's I don't know. It was very affecting. It made me think of. Um, did you ever did you ever see Grave of the Fireflies? No. It's an animated film. Um, I want to say Miyazaki was involved. I think Ghibli, Studio Ghibli may have been involved as well. But he he didn't direct, but I think he may have produced or something. But it's an, it's an anime. I don't know. It just has a lot to do with the bombing that took place in, in Nagasaki or Hiroshima. Oh, okay, both. yeah. It's a very affecting movie. And, and this this honestly like hit me harder than I thought it would. Just because it's like people people don't think that this stuff is possible anymore. Like People are so right. safe feeling. And well, like, and what's sad about it is we got a really strong sense that the people in the city are being lied to and like they don't think the war is bad like they don't they think their husbands are going to be back in a few days they definitely don't know that they're about to die right 
Right. Like, it, because they're being lied to so much that all the people who get killed by the bomb are completely unaware that this is even, like, how they got to this point. Right. And it's also people people choosing choosing escapism and and like i i mean they chose this yeah i love escapism like i'm all for it you know what i mean like it's 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 not necessarily the the act of escapism but i love the the reading and i love i love being in a different world and, and experiencing different different viewpoints but like this is something that we're seeing now where people are just like as long as i have this 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 and this as long as i have my social media as long as i have my my shows as long as i have whatever it is I'm fine and I don't worry about politics. I don't worry about any of this stuff. And like, it's just like, you can just draw so many parallels to the things that, that like, this is what can happen. And I don't know, it's just. It's just a brilliant cautionary tale um, if you look at it that way. But it is also like, I did not remember this book being so grim in the Mm -hmm. end. And I liked it though. You know, like this, it's setting up so many post-apocalyptic stories that we got following this, right? Right. Mad Max. (laughs) Like like you said, like Book of Eli. You know, yeah. it's it, it, the world is blown up now and it, it's going to be them having to rebuild it f- from scratch with these mm-hmm. people who've memorized books being kind of the foundational. So right. let me just finish out what happens here. Granger says everyone must leave something behind when he dies. And he talks about books. He talks about children. He talks about a gardener leaving behind like a garden. And he says like anything, but you have to create and leave it behind when you die. And I thought that mm-hmm. was a really interesting as someone who, you know, is trying to write books you know what i mean like that kind of stuff like it, it's it's that is pretty true to me like the mm-hmm. call to create in some fashion yeah like and legacy and like leaving something behind for for someone else to to see uh, it's like proof this is, you were alive right exactly i think everybody wants that that's something that everybody yearns for um and that's kind of where i where i think the thought of this ending and like uh earlier in the episode i was talking about how i literally i was taking it literally when he's talking about building or burning I feel like this is this this is like the conclusion of what I was trying to say there where like like everyone should be striving to leave something behind whether it's like a legacy of helping others whether whatever it is you're building as long as you're building something and leaving leaving the earth better than you found it and and I think that's just like another thing that he's trying to thread into this story. Yeah. So they decide they're going to go back into the city to help people. And as they're going back in, uh, Montag remembers a quote he's going to read from 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 the Bible, and he chooses the specific one that he thinks I'm going to read this at noon when we're in the city, and then that's the end of the book. And it was an interesting place to end. And I wanted to know: Do you think that that's a sign that he has achieved some sort of agency that he's been chasing throughout this whole book? I think definitely. I think he's found the people who he feels like he can he can learn from and they can learn from him because he has he has some bit of knowledge that no one else does and he can use that to spread this to future generations and and that's him uh taking his agency i i mean i think so what do you think yeah i mean he's 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 had he has a moment where he feels like he can teach people something Mm -hmm. he can impart knowledge and and he can affect the world and like we just talked about you know people want to do that and i think that's what montag has wanted it's like he finds his answers but then he also finds a purpose for himself that he's been seeking mm-hmm. so even though the world just got blown to shit for him it is like he's finally got the thing he's been looking for i also wanted to know do you think faber survives this blast i, I think so i think there was a line in there of, about how he's like tr- in transit in between the cities he's, he's like on a bus or something yeah i think um, montag says i hope you made it right onto the bus or whatever so i'm not sure i mean i i i drew from that that he did that he was on a bus in between the cities yeah. and so he wasn't hit by the blast but he'll be affected when he gets there when he gets to a place that doesn't exist anymore we certainly don't know but right. um it's it is i think it's interesting i th- i think going forward and in, into the adaptations it's interesting to pay attention to those these these kind of things if, if we mm-hmm. do get these same characters um i also read in the afterward and i don't know if you got to this part bradbury mentions the adaptation the movie and he says in the movie, Clarice is with the camp when Montag arrives there. She's alive. Oh, and she's cool. gone and joined this camp. And he said um, and when he, he wrote his play, he included that in his play. But he didn't want to release a new version of the book that had there in there because he didn't want to like adjust what he originally wrote. Right. And so I think that is a pretty pretty big difference, right? It's a more uplifting and more positive note to have her survive and be in the camp versus this where she's just dead. Right. I, I like the I like the idea 
that she survived and I like the silver lining of of hope being alive and like like with them going out and going to help people and spread knowledge and I like the idea of her surviving but I think um ultimately I like this book as it is because it does have that sad melancholy ending or, or at least it left me feeling melancholy because he it, it's so much more affecting um I think that if you have too much happiness at the end then it it, it could I'm not saying it does, but it could take away from this, some of the lessons learned. And I don't know. I just feel like sometimes these difficult stories are are needed. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think, um, yeah, I don't know if I fall either way. I am going to be interested to see how they handle it, you know, yeah. if this character is in the new one. Mm-hmm. So I also wanted to just talk about the war and the bombs and everything and how it plays into the story because I, I'm kind of of two minds about it. Because it feels a little bit like a deus ex machina, you know, Mm -hmm. that he happens to escape the city (laughs) right before the bomb drops. Mm -hmm. It it almost feels a little bit too convenient. But on the and like, but on the other hand, it also really works, I guess, in a different way. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Because they have been setting it up and they have been mentioning this war. I think they really underplayed the danger of it. But we always had this implication that it was pretty bad. And there's you kept seeing these fighter jets flying around and stuff. I don't know. Like, did you think about that at all? Did it feel too contrived? It, I didn't feel like it. it not to me. Um, I do think that it's a little convenient that he left and then it happens all right there. But I think it makes sense to the story. Yeah, and he finds the he finds the camp right away. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of convenient things that happen in there. Which I don't know if we said the camp is also the camp is also full of a bunch of like professors and like doctors and like intellectuals who we've learned are are basically hobos now. <laughs> right. And I kind of got the idea that maybe some of them had memorized multiple books. Yeah. But th- maybe, there was like yeah. certain ones that were like very important. And they mentioned, you know, like you said before, they mentioned a lot of men, um, which I, I don't think that I picked up on uh, any yeah. women being mentioned, but I think a it's lot all of men, yeah. men's work, uh, but just work in general. And men famous, in the camp. I don't works. think there was any women in the camp that I heard of, at least. I mean, I there might have so been, either. but we didn't hear them named. Yeah. It's also interesting that all the cities go, right? I mean, I guess it just makes sense. This is the high population areas. In general, cities tend to be bastions of more free thought. Right. But I guess in a totalitarian state where it's so just integrated society, that's not true. Like societies are, are just distilled terribleness. I thought more. Right. I was thinking more population density, but that is a good exactly. point to bring up. So we wanted to try this new segment on the show. Um, we don't really have a specific name for it yet, but what we're, what <laughs> I, I peruse Reddit a lot and... Uh, I see a lot of interesting threads that I ended up sending to Luke, and uh, he had the idea that maybe we should start reading some of them on the air. Yeah, and I mean, Reddit, a lot of them do deep dives and find little stuff, you know, and it's it's yeah, uh, groupthink, not groupthink, um, crowd, crowdsourced is what I'm looking for, like crowdsourced mm-hmm. knowledge. So why not? I mean, it's a great reference. We might as well use it. Yeah, it's a good way to find interesting stuff, and it, there's always something fun to learn on there. So I have a couple here, and we're just going to talk through them. And I haven't heard these, so I'm going to just react to them. Right. You, I'm, I'm. Some of this you may have heard in the afterward because right. I listened to some of the afterward. But anyway, um, the first one here is by user Shuman Fu. It says, "Today I learned Ray Bradbury wrote the first draft of Fahrenheit 451 on a coin-operated typewriter in the basement of the UCLA library. It charged ten cents for thirty minutes, and he spent nine dollars and eighty cents in total at the machine." Yeah, I, that was in the afterward, um, and that was crazy because he was talking about how he wrote. The first draft of this novel, which was only 25,000 words, so you could argue at that point it wasn't a novel, it was a novella, mm-hmm. um, and he, but he wrote it over nine days doing that, and when he sat down, he was on a timer before like he couldn't type anymore, which is amazing, and so he just blazed it out, and like talk about like if you want to increase your productivity, that's the way to do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the afterward, uh, which th- the part that I read, he talked about how... Um, He's so distracted by his children, like he just yeah. wanted to play with his children, and so like he he had to find a, another way to to write. Um, so he used this UCLA basement to to write it. And I'm assuming I I believe something was talked about in the afterward as well is that he he had like written most of the draft, the 25,000 words, and uh, and then went and typed away at it. But ultimately, the thing that he typed up ended up being his full novel. I think right. Yeah, it was the first draft of the novel, yeah. Right. So, I mean, that's unbelievable. And, yeah, like, just to, just to think about a young Bray, Ray Bradbury in the basement of UCLA just typing away. Fahrenheit 451, man. Very, very... That's uh, cool. I don't know. Very interesting little thing there. All right. So, the next one I found was um, 
posted by user UCDEMH. I don't think it really spells anything out, so I was just going to read the letters. Uh, okay. It says, today I learned that Ray Bradbury's for Fahrenheit 451 was actually about how television destroys in interest in literature, not about censorship. And while giving a lecture in UCLA, the class told him he was wrong and his own about his own book, and he just walked away. <laughs> so this is another thing I feel like we should mention with this Reddit thing that we're going to be doing is that I'm going to look into it and see how, like how how reputable these sources are and stuff. But sometimes it, it ends up being like people's interpretations of it. And sometimes yeah. it ends up being like articles and other things sure. that are just sources posting. So I feel like that's it's something a, we should definitely It's an interesting interpretation and I think it's valid. Right. And this is something we've talked about in other projects. The, the concept of the death of the author. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean that, I mean, once again, we're talking about an author who is dead. But literally, um, people say that when you publish a book, you you become separated from that thing. And now it is it is itself an entity that is free to be interpreted and, 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 and the meaning is in and of itself inherent and not necessarily what the author might want to put back on it, especially at a later date, right? Um, right. So the idea that they told the author that he's wrong is really interesting because that's like, that's that like dramatized, right? Where like literally you right. can't like you're wrong author you're the, about your own book. Yeah, and it's very interesting to think that like uh, because I felt like as we were starting the story it was about censorship and the further we got I felt like it may have also been like a commentary on like I said before like television and and then reading this definitely made me think oh maybe I, mean, I would argue that it's all of that. these things right that's what I was saying and and so that's why I think you're really going to enjoy the top comment on this one so the user on this comment is immortal Azrael and the comment is if someone tells you what a story is about they are probably right if they tell you that that is all the story is about they are definitely wrong and what this quote is is it's from Neil Gaiman's introduction to the 60th anniversary edition of Fahrenheit 451 Dude, you should have asked me. I actually knew that was a Neil Gaiman quote. Really? I was really proud of myself. I was like, I'm pretty sure that's a Neil Gaiman quote. As he was yeah. saying it, I was wondering if the guy was going to take it as his own, and I was going to call him on it. Oh, no, no, no. Um, so, that's cool, dude. I didn't know it was in Fahrenheit 451. Exactly. That's I, what's crazy I, yeah. about it. I did know it was really Neil cool. Gaiman. Yeah, so basically what you were just saying, right? It's not necessarily about, it can't, if somebody's telling you that that's the, if this is the only thing that this can be interpreted as, or if this yeah, is the only thing that wrong. this is about. This is not not really the right way to be thinking yeah. about. It's all books. it's 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 the, all those things and more. It's what we could, just got out of it. You know, it's what the next person who reads it gets out of it. It's what person at home who's listening to this got out of it. That's different than what we got. You know, things we've missed. That's why we'd like for people to write in and tell us stuff. You know, because I think it just broadens my appreciation for a book and for a piece of art and 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 maybe introduces something I didn't think about. Well, yeah, the the conversation and the different viewpoints is what enhances you know, cr criticism or, or yeah. constructive criticism or yeah, conversation yeah. is what I think can elevate art in, in many and different if, ways. If we didn't love that, I don't think we'd do this podcast. Right. And if people didn't love that, they probably wouldn't listen to this podcast. So, you know, I think that's like an important part of, uh, I think it's a, an important part of art and consuming it and, and, and letting especially important things like this affect us. All right, last one here. It Kay. says, it's Lolly Lou, user Lolly Lou posted this. Uh, and I think you're really going to like this one. Uh, the, okay. the post is, it was a pleasure to burn. Ray Bradbury, Fahrenheit 451, the greatest opening lines from the 1950s novels. The reason I bring this one up is because um, the comments of it. Um, okay. I know that you loved that opening and we talked about it in, in our first episode. Do people comment other op great opening lines? Um, in the in the I think in the article there is, but but specifically okay. what I wanted to talk about was the, in the okay. comments. There is, uh, the top comment on here is by... I'm going to say Rusu, and they say Fahrenheit 451 has my favorite paragraph I've ever read. Published in 1953, it was relevant then, even more relevant when I first read it 10 years ago, and more relevant still today. Here it is. So this is a little long, but I'm going to try to run through this. Okay. Because I feel like this is a very affecting piece of this, of this work. Peace, Montag. Give the people contests they win by remembering the words to more popular songs or the names of state capitals or how much corn Iowa grew last year. Cram them full of non-combustible data. Chalk them so damn full of facts they feel stuffed, but also brilliant with information. Then they'll feel their, their thinking. They'll get a sense of motion without moving. And they'll be happy because facts of that sort don't change. Don't give them any slippery stuff like philosophy or sociology to tie things up with. That way lies melancholy. 
any man who can take a TV wall apart and put it back together again, and most men can nowadays, is happier than any man who tries to slide rule, measure, equate the, and equate the universe, which just won't be measured or equated without making man feel bestial and lonely. I know I've tried to hell with it. And so that was Beatty. Yeah, that was Beatty during his um, initial visit to Montag's house. Right. And we talked about in, in the first episode, we actually like talked and said, like, you guys should go read this. And yeah. I mean, this is this is my favorite part of the book as well, because it's 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 it, you can draw so many parallels to what's yeah. going on. And yeah, and, and reality television and uh, society. Mm-hmm. And that's only it's a small a section of, of that piece. Like he continues to talk about other things that are also relevant. All right. So I think that's it for this Reddit what do, we, do we want to call it like Reddit Corner or something for now? I don't know. Reddit the, Reddit Roundup has a nice like uh, uh, alliteration to alliteration, it. But yeah. I know we also were doing something for our Patreon. We call it a Roundup. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I'm just going to call it for now like our, our trial Reddit. Check it in with Reddit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody has any ideas, let us know. <laughs> yeah. All right, Luke. So we finished this book here and we're going to be going into the movie. So I want to ask you predictions that you have for the movie going forward. Um, but okay. let's save that for the very end. All right. I do have a few I think I'd like to I'd like to put trot out there and see uh I'm sure to be wrong. But <laughs> uh yeah, let's let's do that. It sounds good. Um before we get to that, uh we just wanted to mention that we started a Patreon and we're doing it because we want to the uh we want to keep this show going, you know, like we really love doing it and we're trying to fund the show so that it, it pays for itself, right? And then maybe we can even start doing some upgrades. We have multiple levels on Patreon. If you check us out, it's patreon.com forward slash ink to film. You can see we have three different levels. You can choose with different rewards. I won't go through them all. Um, but the biggest one is the $10 a month level. And we actually have a few people signed up for it very graciously. And they're going to be getting some swag, if you want to call it that, um, which I just got in. Um, we're hopefully going to be sending it out probably next month once we get some payments in so we can afford it. Um, but yeah, it's like a bookmark, a pin, a magnet and a sticker and like i have pictures of this stuff on our instagram if you want to see it uh, i may have put it on twitter too um i think they look great I, I really like the way the magnets turned out i'm pretty happy with it so uh yeah you could become a donor and get those uh like chris c who has been with us from the beginning uh been a huge supporter of ours so i just want to shout him out big thank you to him for for being a donor on uh patreon definitely we really appreciate it man so yeah if you wanted to check out our patreon that would be awesome also, if you wanted to connect with us, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that good stuff. Uh, at Ink to Film, we're active on there. So, so you know, send us a message, comment on anything we post, and and it'll be fun to interact with you. I don't know if you saw it recently, but uh, we had a I put a tweet out for an annihilation thing. It was a comment on this viral tweet, and it got liked by Jeff Vandermeer. So, pretty happy about that. Yeah, that was. Good to see I mean, that, that was surreal. At least for a moment, he was aware of us. Yeah, man, he saw he saw the logo at least, right? He saw the Ink to Film logo. <laughs> I was excited about yeah. that, man. You're you're doing a great job over there. You do a lot of our social media stuff, and uh, that was yeah. that was so much fun to see. Yeah, please come connect with us. Absolutely. We also wanted to say, if you enjoy the show, uh, leaving us a rating and a review and subscribing, those three things together is like the best way to subs- to to support this show. If you don't want to spend any money and become a patron, um, but that's super helpful. We would gladly appreciate anything you you're willing to give us. It, just a moment of your time. Type up a little review. It could just be one sentence. Get, leave us five stars if you loved it. Uh, four if you didn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll take anything. No, no less than that. <laughs> no, we'll take anything. Honest review. Um, but it helps us, right? It helps us with our rankings, with our visibility. Someone stumbles along and sees your words. It can help them check out our show, which we'd love to have. Um, so, yeah, make sure you subscribe, rate, and review. Also, if you wanted to leave feedback uh, for the show, any suggestions you have, if you liked the projects, if you have ideas for future projects. If you have an idea for our, our Reddit our Reddit section, what to call it. <laughs> yeah, or yeah, what to call our Reddit section. If you see anything on Reddit and you want to send it to me on Facebook or Twitter or anything, definitely let me know. So if you wanted to leave us that feedback, you would go to inktofilm at gmail.com. Just send it over there. and Yeah, so we just want to thank Audible for giving us that affiliate link. It's audibletrial.com forward slash inktofilm. Use that. You can get a free book and free 30 days. And we also want to thank Ross Bugden for the use of our intro and outro music, which is pretty awesome this week. I agree. All right, Luke, let's hear some predictions, man. Okay, so not first off, I'm super excited for this movie. I've been seeing trailers. Start, uh, literally, HBO put out a thing today, and it was like a live stream of Michael B. Jordan talking to us, and there was like little emojis popping up beside it. I don't know if you saw this. Mm-hmm. And I just think it's really clever, and I hope that that reflects the movie 
being this like modernized version of this. Like that's what I want, right? Like mm-hmm. I want it to feel even more authentic to our world and what we can see happening. Right. And that I'm super excited about. Um, I do think we're going to get more details about these characters. I think we're going to learn more about Beatty. Um, and Michael Shannon portraying him looks really intimidating and just like his, uh, he's going to give these monologues and they're going to be great. I can't wait to um, see those two clash. Yeah. And, and like, I, I don't know, I, I guess I'm just interested to see what they do with Clarice and, and, and whether or not she survives. I'm also really interested to see if they, if the whole thing's going to end in a boom, you know what I mean? Like, is this going to end in, a, in, in, in the world exploding? I think so. Man. I don't know. If, as far like, do you think it does? yeah, I do. If, if, HBO and I mean if they want to stick closely to his source material they absolutely should do it and I mean it's such a powerful exclamation point at the end of this story it's like it's like he literally dropped the bomb restarting the world and like that's like what like I think that that's how the story ends like I think that that's this okay you've led me to a new new, a new prediction okay I I don't think they're gonna do it oh yeah I think this we're going to see Montag leading a revolution of some kind and and it's going to be it's going to end with like i don't think we're going to see the bombs i i don't like i i feel like it's going to be he's going to join this movement i don't know i mean i i kind of hope i'm wrong because i kind of i kind of agree with you Mm -hmm. that's the right way to end it but i i get a feel i have a suspicion that they're going to want to end it on a more optimistic note right than the book ends on. In the, so we'll see. In our last episode, I made predictions of the second half of the book, and I predicted that yeah. that Montag would like join up with like a group of rebellious just people who are. Yeah, you had that. But but um, like I said before, I feel like it, it just went further than I expected it to. Like they, he still ended right. up doing that, and like we've seen we've seen you know the guy joining the revolution before. So I really hope it's more than that. Like I don't want it to just be what we've seen before, where he just he. <laughs> fights against the people who he like Beatty like I want to see him clash with Beatty but I don't what I don't want to see is once that clash is over where he just like finds a rev- revolution to be a part of and he like leads these people and they, they well and that's the thing you 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 said that but and like I said you called it but these guys weren't really freedom fighters or anything right. they were like hobos living on the side of the road just surviving right and it's only because of the war that they're going to be able to like carry on so they weren't really like a rebellion, right? That he was really joining. They were just survivors, um, whose existence is an act of a rebellion. You could argue, but you know what I mean. They're not active. They weren't actively fighting. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I guess I kind of agree with you. I I think I I would need to see how it was executed. That's gonna. It all comes down to that for me. Like it all comes down to execution and how it's done. And is it surprising enough? Um, I'm. I'm okay, I guess I'm. I'm okay with them changing it if they land it. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Right. I, I agree. I, like, it doesn't, have, they don't have to drop a bomb, but I think that whatever happens at the end has to have as much impact as dropping the bomb would have. Right. All right, man. I'm excited for it. I hope you guys check it out. I think it's coming out early next week. Um, we're going to, we're going to watch it um, coming out soon. <laughs> um, and we'll have our episode next week out for the movie. And we hope you guys join us for it. Until then, I'm Luke. And I'm James. See ya. <laughs>